Good morning, Grace Fellowship. Welcome here. It's good to be with you again. My name is Mark. If you don't know who I am, I am one of the pastors here along with Clay. We pastor this church here together. And we are nearing the end of our uh, short series in the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. And it has been, for me at least, so good uh, to be going through this passage, just seeing um, God's Word and how God works in Habakkuk just to increase his faith, even in some of the most uh, difficult situations. And for me, it's been very, um, I guess you could say it's been very instrumental in building my faith in Jesus, decreasing my worry and my anxiety in day-to-day life as I rest in Jesus. This book has been uh, really good for me to just take my eyes off of myself and my own abilities or inabilities, um, the things that uh, overwhelm me. And, and it's just pointed me back to the Father who loves and carries me through even the most difficult times. And so we are in the last chapter today. We'll be in Habakkuk or Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 1 to 16. If you have no idea where that book is in your Bible, that's okay. It's not really one of the well-known books, um, and it is quite short. It is near the end of the Old Testament, larger portion of the Bible. You may have to use your table of contents to find it. That's totally fine. Um, Or you can just use the search function on your Bible app if that's what you have. I think you're going to find it super helpful to have it in front of you open while we go through the text this morning, whether in book or app form, either is fine with me. So we'll play the scripture passage out on the screen behind me, and then we're going to pray together, and then we'll go through uh, this prayer that Habakkuk prays to his heavenly Father this morning. Reading from Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigayanath. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Selah. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation? You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows, Selah. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. Selah. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. All right, before we dive into that text, let's just uh, open up with a word of prayer. Father, we come to, to you today. Um, once again, we're, we're thankful that we have this uh, privilege and this opportunity to read your word and to come together and understand it this morning. There are many people today and, and throughout history who maybe don't have this privilege, and so we want to say thank you for that. Would you prepare our hearts right now to hear and understand what you want us to learn uh, through this scripture, Lord? I just pray that uh, your character would be revealed through this passage, through this prayer of Habakkuk, that our trust in you and our faith in you, our love for you would increase this morning. 
as we have been seeing Habakkuk's faith increase. I pray for an understanding of this text at a deep heart level so that our outlook on this life changes from an earthly perspective to a kingdom perspective this morning. Pray this in your name. Amen. Now, as the scripture video played out on the screen behind me, you may have felt maybe just a little more confused than anything. This isn't one of those passages that you can just read and go, well, that makes complete sense. I totally get it without knowing the surrounding context or, or maybe just a little bit of explanation. We need a wee bit of help for this passage this morning for a complete understanding of what is going on here. Now, over the first two chapters of this book, Habakkuk has been complaining to God about the wickedness of the people of God, and the people of Judah have been living in gross sin of all different kinds, and he wants God to do something about it. He's been bringing this to God's attention. And so he's been praying to God, talking with him, and just pointing out the mess of Judah. And God responds to Habakkuk, and God tells him that he's he's going to send this evil army to carry out a judgment on Judah Um, They're going to overtake the city of Jerusalem, they will capture the people, and they will keep them in captivity. And and this is all going to happen as a a type of judgment or or punishment for the sin of Judah. Now, of course, that's not what Habakkuk was hoping for when he prayed to God. He wanted things to get better, and to him, um, this was getting worse. But God reminds him that he has his plan, and it is for the good of the people that they go through this very difficult time, this attack. It is to bring his people back to him that God is going to allow this evil army of the Chaldeans to come and attack Judah. When Judah wanders away from God, they needed a reminder of their need for God. And so God is planning to send this very clear reminder that on their own, the people of Judah, they're nothing. They need God. And they will soon understand that very clearly as they're about to come under attack and and as they're going to be unable to to respond to this attack with any victory. So God is using a very bad thing to bring about the ultimate good for his people. So God, he has planned this attack to bring his people back to him. And Habakkuk is really not very happy about this, as you could imagine, as it means his life is now going to get very difficult over the next little while. And Habakkuk He's been having this conversation with God about what's about to happen, hoping that maybe there would be another way for God to deal with all these sinful people of Judah, but God helps Habakkuk to see that his plan is for the best. He did not explain it to Habakkuk why his plan is the best, but he helped Habakkuk see his character more clearly through the conversation that Habakkuk has been having with God. So Habakkuk's faith in God himself was increased. He didn't need to worry about all the little details. He just needed to know that God was in control and God was for them. He wasn't against them, even when it didn't seem so. He didn't need to know why this was ultimately for the best. Habakkuk didn't need to know why this was for the best of the people, but he just needed to know that if God was good and if God was ultimately concerned for the good of his people, then this plan would be for their good. In the end, the bad things would be for their good. And if God wants to bring his people to him, and if he loves his people, then what he allows to happen to them will be for their good, even though they may never understand it here on this earth. Our faith need not lie in all of the things that are going on around us. We need not put our trust in in these things that are happening to us or situations that we find ourselves in, but we can put our full trust in God so that even if everything appears to be falling apart or all around us, we know that God is good and he's in control of everything that seems to be out of control. And so Habakkuk, he wraps up this conversation with God with a prayer, the prayer that we just listened to on the screen behind us. And this prayer, it's full of renewed faith in God, even though he knows that his near future will be very difficult. His city and his country are going to be destroyed, as God has just told him. He might be captured and suffer as a prisoner of war for a time, but God reminded him of who he was and his character and that he is for his people. He could trust God even in the difficulty, even in the hard times. He didn't need to worry. He didn't need to be anxious. God was for him even when everything seemed hopeless. When the world seemed as though it was going to collapse around him, 
Habakkuk, he prays this prayer to finish off this book. And it's so good, and I hope that we too can have such confidence in God as Habakkuk does in this prayer. So let's dive into chapter 3 right now, verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigianoth. I think that's how you say that word. I don't even know. <laughs> so this prayer of Habakkuk, it says it's according to Shigianoth. And I'm willing to bet that um, none of you have heard that word before, likely. And truthfully, its exact uh, meaning is unknown other than that it is some sort of a poetic or a musical term. So this prayer is not just conversation with God, but there is an artistic element to this prayer as well. After Habakkuk's initial conversation with God, his final response to God in this book is well thought out. It is arranged in some sort of poetry or music. There's an element of artistic beauty about his prayer here that not all prayers have. It's not so obvious in the English as obviously poetry is very hard to translate from language to language poetically. Uh, when you translate a poem from another language, it's often no longer uh, the same type of poem or even a poem at all. It lacks maybe the rhythm and the rhyme, but, but rather it's just the, more the plain meaning of the words. But we get the idea here that Habakkuk has put much thought into his response to God. And Habakkuk starts out in verse 2. He says, O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear in the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So Habakkuk tells God that he fears God and his work. In other words, he understands the power and the might of God. Just, just a chapter earlier, he, he, Habakkuk was fearing God. The, the power and the might of the, the armies of the Chaldeans, but his faith has grown to a point where he now understands that the power of God is far beyond the most powerful army in the world, and God is ultimately for his people, so he need not fear the Chaldeans that were coming. He should rather remember and respect or fear the work of God, and he asks God to revive his work. It seemed to Habakkuk that God has been absent in the nation of Judah. They've just been allowed to to run amok, steeped in sin and injustice. And, and now Habakkuk wants God to do his work. But in God's wrath and in God's judgment on Judah, Habakkuk asks God to remember mercy. He knows wrath is coming, but he also knows that God is merciful to those whom he loves. And for the rest of this prayer, Habakkuk poetically or, or musically points out the powerful attributes of God, his God who is allowing, or this God, sorry, who is allowing the wrath of the Chaldeans to fall upon his people was far more powerful than the army. In chapter one, Habakkuk writes about how powerful this army is. In chapter two, God reminds Habakkuk that even though this army is coming to pour out judgment on the people of Judah, the Chaldeans will suffer for the sin of what they're about to do. And by chapter 3, Habakkuk, he acknowledges or he understands that God is in control of everyone or everything, including the Chaldeans, and he will punish those people who hurt his people. Nothing in this world is out of God's control. And so Habakkuk reminds himself of this through his prayer to God. And so Habakkuk goes from having fear in the trials that are about to come, this Chaldean or the Babylonian army, to understanding that he ought to fear God alone because God is far more powerful and bigger than anything or anyone that could harm him here in this world. Verse 3, God came from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor covers the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Now, Habakkuk continues to tell, of, to tell God of his splen splendor. He's praying to God these words, reminding himself of God's goodness when he says that God came from Taman, it doesn't mean that God came from a place here on earth. But if you lived in Judah, uh, Taman was um, to the far east of Judah, and that's where the sun rose for Judah, over Mount Paran. So he's reminding that himself that God is like the sun in the sense that he did not know why and he did not know how, but the sun comes up every day from the east, and it gives light to the earth. In the same way that he didn't understand how the sun worked, he didn't fully understand how God worked in the same way that the sun was reliable, faithfully rising every day without fail. So God was reliable and faithful to his people. Habakkuk could trust him. 
He knew that God was always there and he was over everything, just like the sun was over everything and the world was a better place when God showed himself to them, just like the sun. Verse four, his brightness was like a light. Rays flashed from his hand and there he veiled his power. So God's brightness, like the sun, was a great light that was too bright to look at, according to Habakkuk in his artistic prayer. His power too much for man to handle. And so we just get to see a glimpse of it. God must veil his power and his glory and his might, his perfection, so that we're not consumed by it. Verses five and six, before him went pestilence and plague, followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth and he looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered and everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. So Habakkuk, he continues on telling God, of his characteristics, how God is in control of pestilence and plagues. COVID-19 would fall into that category. He created the world and everything in it. He shaped the mountains and put them in their place, and he allows nations to form, and he allowed them to perish on his say-so. Verses 7 to 8, he says, I saw the nets, or sorry, the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation? So Habakkuk, he's seeing these foreign nations tremble, probably with earthquakes or fear from other armies. And he asked this rhetorical question, were you mad at the earth, God? Are you mad at the rivers and the sea? And the answer is no. God is not angry with the earth so much as he is angry with those who have tainted his creation with sin. God was not angry with the rivers or the sea. He had become angry with those who, whom he had created and whom had made a mess of this life, those who were disobedient and had made themselves gods over their own lives, disregarding the design that God had for his creation. Verses 9 to 12, he says, You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows, Selah. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury and you threshed the nations in anger. So Habakkuk sees the power of God on this earth. There was and there will be earthquakes and volcanoes and mountains, they, they writhe or move about in pain, waters rage, there's going to be tsunamis, the nations of the world will be threshed in anger. I don't know if you know what threshed means, but it's an antique form of combining. It's what a farmer had to do to the crop to get the grain. Now today, farmers run the grain through a combine. We can't really see the inner workings of how the grain is separated from the chaff and the straw. But back in the day, during these Old Testament times, the standing crop would be cut down and they would be uh, bundled into these bundles and those bundles would be brought to the threshing room floor and they would be beat against the floor so that the grain would fall off of the straw. Or they would pile up a bunch of the crop um, that had been cut down on the, on, onto the floor and the donkeys would walk all over it. And, and this was called threshing. And you get the idea of the nations of the world being threshed or beaten down to, to separate the grain from the straw. The difficult times, or, or the threshing, it serves to reveal those who are truly God's people and who are not. Who is the grain, or who is the fruit of the harvest, and who is not? Verses 13 to 15, he's still talking to God. He says, you went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. Selah. You pierced, his own, you pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me. Rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of the mighty waters. So Habakkuk, he understands that all these crazy things, all these bad things, all these tragedies that, that were happening or were about to happen to Judah would ultimately be for the salvation of God's people. You went out for the salvation of your people, verse 13. God was out and about showing his might, his power, his judgment through natural disasters, through plagues, through disease, through wars, through, through foreign armies. And in the end, it was all for the salvation of his people. The whirlwinds, the raging waters, it was ultimately all for the salvation of his people. Habakkuk, 
at this time did not fully understand why all these things must happen, but he knew one thing. God was in control of all of it, and he did not need to fear any of it because God was for his people. God's might and power was beyond anything or anyone here on this earth. And God was using his power to save his people even in all of these difficult situations. God was working out the salvation of his people. God was going to crush all of Judah's enemies in due time, but most importantly, he would crush Satan, sin, and death for them. There's a great comfort and a great fear in knowing God and his power. Knowing who God is ultimately reveals to us personally that we are unworthy sinners who deserve all of this judgment that Habakkuk describes in this prayer. The more we know of God, the more we ought to have this fear of God, just as Habakkuk feared God in verse 1. We should have a fear of sinning against him, of going against his design, of making ourselves gods over our own life. It should bother us to go against him. We should have a healthy fear of who God is and what he can do. Habakkuk did. Verse 16, he says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Habakkuk was not mustering up some false sense of bravery or courage. He was genuinely fearful of what God was going to allow to happen to his people, his city, and his nation. But the last part of verse 16, he just reminds himself that those who are about to hurt God's people will also suffer judgment. And he comforts himself knowing that, that God is allowing this hardship ultimately for the good of his people, or he wouldn't be doing it. Those through whom this hardship comes will reap the reward for what they have done. They will suffer the wrath of God. And Habakkuk is going to wait for that day. He will find a satisfaction in that. He knows that God is faithful, and God will save his people, even through very difficult times. Even, through, even though uh, this judgment that they had brought upon themselves would be difficult, God would save them through it. And Habakkuk is still going to rejoice, actually, rejoice in all of it. We see that in verse 18 of our text from next week. According to Habakkuk's prayer, even though the world is imploding and all these bad things are happening, God is still good and he deserves our praise. You see, if we are one of God's children, just like he did for Habakkuk, God went out, as Habakkuk said, for our salvation. He allowed some very bad things to happen so that we might have life with him and have it eternally. You see, God sent his son to this world to live perfectly, then unjustly suffer and die on the cross, falsely accused, to pay for our sin. You see, we are just like Judah in the book of Habakkuk, and we are a mess. We are full of sin, and we deserve this wrath of God. But God, in his wrath, remembered mercy, just as Habakkuk prayed for. Habakkuk prayed for God's mercy, and in, even in his wrath, God answered Habakkuk's prayer, even for us today. God the Father sent his Son to bear that wrath in full, because we cannot bear it, and Judah could not bear it. We would be destroyed, and Judah would have been completely destroyed if they had borne the full wrath of God that they deserved and that we deserve. We have been a rebellious and a sinful people, all of us. His wrath and power were held back for a while, veiled according to verse 4. But when it came to Jesus, when Jesus came to earth, he suffered the full force of that wrath so it would be satisfied once and for all. All of it 
fell on Jesus. So now God no longer looks upon his children with the destructive anger for their sin. That anger was poured out on his son, Jesus Christ. God's wrath and power poured out on Jesus for our good and for our salvation. We don't need to tremble as Habakkuk did, who is about to suffer a small piece of God's wrath. But rather now we can have comfort in Jesus that he took that wrath for us. Knowing that Jesus has done this, it should really change how we live. Knowing that our sin caused God's wrath to be exercised upon the perfect Son of God, this should cause us to hate sin and to love Jesus because he paid for our sin. It should change us. Now, we do, however, still live in a world that is tainted with sin, and the consequences of that sin will make its way into our lives from time to time. God will allow us to suffer consequences of what we have done. He will allow hardships to come our way to bring us closer to him. He will allow sickness and disease. But in all of it, we have to remember, just like Habakkuk, that God is ultimately for us if we are his, and we will not suffer the judgment and the full wrath for our sin. What he allows is for our good so that we make it by faith to the end into God's kingdom. This is good. And as we go through the last portion of this book next week, my prayer is that we'll be able to see God's goodness through all the mess of this world and know that even when it seems as though God is against us, even when it seems as though he's absent or <laughs> even when it seems when, like he's intentionally causing us hardship. It's because he loves you and he is working out your salvation in a sense. He is causing things to happen in your life that will bring you or keep you close to him, that will draw you into him. Through all that Habakkuk and his people had to go through, it was for one purpose, and that was that God would not lose his people. The hardships brought them closer to him, and maybe that's what God is doing to you right now. Maybe he has taken away something really special to you. Maybe a family member or a child or a mother or father or a brother or sister, a husband or a wife. And maybe you cannot understand how he could allow that to happen to you. How can a good God allow bad things to happen? Maybe he's trying to help you see that he is better than all those relationships and all those things that you hold dear. And he wants you to have a true and better relationship with him. Better than any relationship you could have here on this earth. He's bringing you closer to him. Maybe he has taken away your wealth and you wonder how God can call himself a loving God if, if he takes these good things away from his children. Maybe he's helping you see that true wealth doesn't lie in, in dollars or silver or gold or, or, or Bitcoin, but rather in Jesus. Knowing him is the ultimate store of wealth for eternity. Earthly wealth is nothing compared to Jesus. He cares for you enough to help you see that truth. When sickness or relationship breakdown or financial trials or whatever else pops up in your life, remind yourself of God's great power. His power to overcome all of it and remind yourself that God is for you you are his child. All that is happening is in God's control under his power. Not putting your faith in him is far more terrifying than any bad thing that he might allow to enter your life. Trust the one who holds all the power. Trust the one who holds all the wisdom. Trust the one who is doing what he does for the salvation of his people. We cannot fully see God's power. We cannot fully see his wrath or his wisdom just yet. Our finite minds cannot comprehend it, but we can know this, that the perfect son of God took the full power and wrath upon himself, and in doing so, he poured out his full love upon us. He purchased us out of our sin, our mess, and made us his own. And so his power now works for us, even when it doesn't seem like it. So instead of focusing on the situations around us, let us focus on Jesus, the one who proved God's love for his people 
by his death on the cross and his resurrection. And let us remind ourselves of his love for us and his power to bring us into his kingdom. Let us not fear what the earth can do to us or people, but let us rest in the knowledge that God is bringing us into his family, into his kingdom. All that happens here is for that purpose. So this morning as a church, let's repent of our sin. Let us repent of our pride in thinking that we know better than God. Let us repent of our sin and turn to God. The hardship that Judah had to go through, it it served to build Habakkuk's faith in God. And my prayer is that any hardship that we go through here today, it serves the same purpose. My hope is that the hardship will cause us to turn from sin and run to Jesus, reorient ourselves towards the prize. Eternal life face to face with Jesus. My prayer is that this is what our hardships will do for us. That they will not be lost on us, but rather that they will cause us to increase our faith and our love for Jesus. Reminding us of who he is and that he's working out the best for us, even when it looks difficult now. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that this passage this morning will have encouraged all of us to turn to you, to find our rest in you this morning, so that we need not fear anything but you. And you are for us, so we can find comfort and peace in that. Thank you for showing us with clarity your love for us by sending your son to be the substitute for us on the cross. We don't deserve such grace and such mercy, and yet you've offered it to us. So thank you, Jesus. Amen.